talk about what contract management is, is basically everything that you heard that what we're doing is that we're just taking all of these things that you've heard in terms of compliance, policies, procedures, processes, and just button them up to make sure that you have a process in place to manage that contract. When you, as an example, if you get a subcontract from, your, from a prime, who manages that contract for you? Or is there a contract? Okay, oh, you're a subcontractor, right? Okay, is there an agreement? Between myself so, and the, yeah. Right, okay, in this, which is still a contract, a mm -hmm. type of contract. So who manages the scope and the terms of that contract for you? Um, the prime does. Okay. We respond. Okay. If it's something we don't agree with within that contract or we add our terms to it. Okay, you add your terms to the contract, okay. Are there any requirements on your part that you have to do for the prime? That are, is there anything that you have to report back up to the prime? Um, no, and possibly, probably because the people we work we worked for mm -hmm. are, is very good at being compliant, and we're mm -hmm. contractors, so we kind of do a mm -hmm. wide range of things. So okay, yeah. okay, so there's not a like sometimes with my client, like me, I'm a sub. Mm -hmm. So if my client gets a, they're the prime, and the contract be, exists between them and the government. Okay. I have a contract with the prime. Okay. There's a written contract with the prime. Mm -hmm. And in my contract, it says what the deliverables are, mm -hmm. the scope of work, the terms, the exclusions, the, you know, all of that stuff. So that's what I'm asking. Do you have something like that in place? Ooh, you might want to take a look at that because that's, um, that, that ex that's some exposure. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, even as subcontractors, I say get all of the contract, the agreements and all of those things, you know, make sure that you have that uh, an understanding of what they are. Because once you get that in place, it manages the contract. It manages the relationship. You don't have to worry about that anymore. But it's those little things that you didn't talk about that came up. There's additional costs. I didn't know I had to cover that cost. Now that money is coming out of your pocket as opposed to the prime. But if you lay out all of those things, the terms and the scope, you know exactly what is expected of you. The, the prime knows what they can expect of you. And it's, you have that relationship. It's on paper. So that's what I was asking because you might want to take a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so having a process and procedures in place, these are the following contract activities that you want to manage. It helps you to have an administration process in place to say this is the plan in terms of how we're going to manage the contract. It helps you to manage your performance because even sometimes when you have a contract, whether it's a subcontract or whether it's a contract as the prime, you can go back in and take a look at what are the requirements. Sometimes what, what, what we call is scope creep, meaning that you've got a scope of work but then if it's not well defined, if there's ambiguity there, next, yeah, it start adding up, you know, all of those things start adding up. And so, you know, is it such where you, it's time for you to do an addendum to the contract to cover all of these things? Um, <clears throat> we talked about the financing and the payment. We talked about that. Also, when, when is, is it appropriate to request a contract modification? dependent on the type of contract that it is, okay? Sometimes scope creep will dictate whether there is a modification in the, in the contract. It just depends. Um, contract disputes. Hopefully you don't have to ever have to deal with a, a dispute as far as a contract is concerned, but sometimes that can be very, very taxing. Like as an example, you submit a bid or you, you submit a bid and then you want to protest, okay? That's the type of dispute as well. It goes to the general, it goes, I think it's GAO, it's GAO.gov, but they're the general attorney, I think it's general attorney office, but they are the ones who take care of all of the disputes and everything for the contracts. Like if you submit a bid and you protest the bid because a larger contract won the bid, but it was a set aside for a small company. So it goes to them. They take a look at it. You can even see it if you, you file a protest. You can go out there and take a look at it. They give it an ID number and all of that stuff. They'll assign an attorney to it. They go through and do their due diligence and tell you what the findings are. Some cases they have to um, cancel the contract, I mean the solicitation, and they start all over again. Okay, But those that's another avenue to say if you feel like in some way you were harmed, 
that that's an avenue in terms of how you would take care of it. Now, if it's a contract dispute between you and an individual or a contractor who's a prime or a company that is a prime here again, what are your terms? How will you settle that? If you do an, have a contract, your contract should stipulate in the event that there's a conflict um, between the two parties, you know, where will the contract, I mean, the conflict be resolved? Is it in Albuquerque, New Mexico? Or is it here in the state of Georgia where your company is set up? Those terms, okay, and then the steps. Are you going to go directly where you're going to litigate it? Or do you want to look at alternatives to say that you want to use alternative dispute? Okay, resources to say that you'll do it that way. So those things should be also included in your contract because that can save you money. Okay, and then um, contract termination and closeout. At the end of a contract, particularly if you're the prime, you know, what are some of the things that you need to do to close out that contract? Or if that contract is being transferred to another contract, or what are some of the things you need to do to close it out? Every contract that you have, whether you're a small company or a large company, you should have a process in place to say that you're closing that contract out because it helps you to reconcile if they're missing things you haven't done that you need to put in place or that you haven't taken, um, that you have not um, I've finalized. This is an opportunity for you to have a check system in place to make sure that you've covered all of those things. Like if you no longer need that account, if you set up a joint venture account, do you still need that joint venture account or do you want to go ahead and close it out? Okay. Um, post award, once you get a contract, you want to make sure that you go through that contract and you read it thoroughly. Um, when you get a solicitation, there's a sample contract that is included in the solicitation. But just because a sample contract is included in the solicitation does not mean that it is exactly the same in terms of the contract that you have. So you need to make sure that you read that copy of the contract before you signed off on it. Okay, reviewing the contract for a schedule. And, and even with this, you want to create a schedule like your startup date. It's like your kickoff. You have a work plan that says the, your kickoff date, the startup date, because if the government says the first phase of the contract has to be delivered in 45 days, how are you going to do it? Are you just going to meander along and just kind of get it done? Or do you want to set up a timeline to make sure you get everything done? Because God forbid you get a contract and now you get a, <laughs> then you get a, a notice from the government saying for non-performance. So you want to make sure once you get a contract, you're going to set up your timeline, but also set up a timeline to say if there are hiccups that happen along the way, you've got some days, you have some time in there to help you with that, to help you mitigate those things. And also milestones. And usually when you set this up, a copy of it goes to the CO because as well, this is part of developing that relationship with the CO is making sure that they understand what your plan is. We know what you said when you respond you know, in your bid, but now it's time to put it into action. And so that plan that you set up, you want to make sure that you're working with the CO and give them a copy of it and say, okay, this is the plan to say how we're going to kick off the meeting and, and execute the contract and let them see what your timeline is and your milestones because that's peace of mind, okay? Mm -hmm. oh. um, read it, okay, we covered that. Um, the contract budget and oversight. And I think you all heard this from Jack as well as you all heard it from Richard, is to make sure that part of it is that you've got a written narrative, your technical response to say what you're going to do and how you're going to do the work. But the other part of it is managing your costs. Don't be, I had a situation where a client, they won the contract and they had a cost proposal, okay? But because they have experience doing it, they have years and years of experience doing this contract. They set aside the budget. That, that they, they just set that aside to say, oh, yeah, we've done this kind of work before. We know that it's going to take X number of this to get it done, that kind of stuff. Well, they set the budget aside. They didn't give a copy of it to the, um, the operations manager. So when they're doing inventory and looking at cost control, that they were using this based on you know, the, the price and the, their um, cost proposal. So they're buying inventory. You know, the person comes in and says, how much do you need this week? How much do you need that week? So they're just buying inventory, buying inventory. 
So midpoint through the contract, they see now they're like $10,000 in the hole. And I said, well, how do we get $10,000 in the hole? Well, it would have helped if you gave your operations manager a copy of the, of the budget because they can order to say, okay, we have a cap to say we can only order this much. Well, they didn't. So Shirley is out there. She's just using her usual routine to order and supplies and stuff. And so they ended up $10,000 in the hole. Now, was that made? It made, it wasn't as major as it could have been. And they were able to recoup some of the, the money that they spent out in other ways. But don't take your budget and sit it on the, on the shelf, you know, just because some people say you manage your money like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, or a, 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 some of that. You, you need to know exactly what your numbers are. Okay. Um, it also, sometimes even as well as we do in terms of writing the proposal, we write our cost proposal and we're going through now that we've got the contract and we're looking at, you know, how to manage the contract and everything. It's not unusual that, that it happens at times is that you see something there that you need to manage. Okay. Whether it's the cost, whether it's you negotiated for a cost that's a little bit lower than what you submitted, because that's not unusual. Sometimes you will submit a budget to the government and they say your pricing is good, but can you sharpen your pencil some? That's not unusual. And if you sharpen your pencil and you notice now, say, ooh, you know, there's a, a less $5,000 that I have in my budget that I really need it. So how are you going to mitigate that? You have to look at ways that you have to mitigate that loss. So even when you get a contract, you still have to make sure that you understand the terms. Um, plan for the loss of key personnel. And when you're doing your contract, you want to make sure that you stay within those parameters in terms of the cost. But what happens if you lose a key personnel and now you got to go out and you have to recruit and replace that person? OK, what about the time, the hours and all the lost productivity? You know, how do you manage that? OK, so all of these little things go back into managing a contract, um, prepare a strategy for addressing risk. And it's to it would behoove you when those situations come up that you take the initiative to contact the contracting officer. And I'll give you an example. I was working with one client and we had a situation where um, we, we had some employees that that left. We had to hire new people. They weren't trained. They had to get trained and everything. So we had a choice. We could have said, okay, I'm going to wait till the contracting officer come to, to come to us. Now, mind you, the contract specialists and all of that, they're on the site. So we contacted the, um, the CEO and we said, okay, this is what happened, but this is our plan to mitigate it. And we wrote down every step with a timeline, just like SMART goes, put a, you time stamp everything to say, okay, this is the problem. This is how we're going to mitigate it. And we want to follow up meeting with you by this date. So that would have given us enough time to put a plan in place to execute that plan, but also to make sure that as we executed that plan, that now we can see where it's addressing some of the problems that it created by losing the staff people. But take that. It is to your advantage to contact the contracting officer to let them know what's happening and how you're going to resolve it, as opposed to they're hearing information that's coming up from the bottom up to them. OK, it would take in your best interest to show and to demonstrate that even though I have an issue, or there's a risk here. I'm taking steps to mitigate that risk. OK. Um, if you got a good project manager on, on, on um, who's helping you manage the, the contract, these are some of the things that they're going to take a look at in terms of anticipating when there are changes that are coming up. As an example, if you know at the beginning of a new contract year that you, you need to negotiate, whether it's the H&W, even if it's the payroll, if you do it, because sometimes people say, well, you know, I don't have to give employees, uh, uh, you know, a cost of living increase, those things. Well, you need to make sure it's in the regs that you don't have to do that. But if you do that at the beginning of your budget, did you take account for if you wanted to do give your employees a, an increase? Did you take that in consideration when you did your budget? So all of those things you need to factor in and. I guess forecast that because part of it is that in terms of mitigating risk is that you want to make sure that you, you retain your employees because if you've got high turnover, that creates a risk for the government. Okay. 
All contract modifications must be communicated in writing, and that is so important. Okay? Um, the have a, yeah, because even when I have a verbal contract, I mean a verbal conversation, if it's important, I send an email to say to recap our conversation because I'm a time stamp it. I'm giving it a date and everything, but I'm going to recap that. So that way it's a written record of what is said. And I will even go so far as to do a read receipt. Yes. Okay. So those are some of the things that you can do when situations like this come up that you need to manage. Okay. Okay, basic requirements when you're talking about invoicing. These are all of the things that are required. But here again, most often when you get a contract and you have to invoice, the government will give you a little template to show you exactly what it looks like. No more, no less. Just follow exactly what they give you, okay? Um, you know, it, these are some of the other elements here. You know, it requires if you need, if it asks for your, your EIN, I mean, your, your tax number, you include that. But oftentimes, too, what the government does is that they will pay you electronically. So do you remember when you went into SAM and you had to set up your <coughs> banking information? Well, if you haven't experienced this, oftentimes what the government will do is that they do electronic fund transfer, mm -hmm. which I love, mm -hmm. you know. You it's, there. it's there, exactly. It helps with payroll, all kind of, you know, it's a good thing. Um, contract termination, okay, when you're talking about things that you need to do to close out a contract, these are all of the things that you want to do because this is the, you're creating like, um, the, the, when you talk about a contract and you're closing it out, you, it's like you're creating a file where you can archive everything so in the event that you have to go back right. and pull that file up, you've got all of these things here in terms of, how, of what you did with that contract. It's like it tells you everything, all of the activity that happened with that contract. Okay? Even when you talk about closing out your financials and your accounts and stuff, that's important. Okay? Um, like you said, where you have like staff release activities, um, the plant, all of those things are important. Can you imagine <clears throat> two years later, you have a contractor, somebody come to you and they say, well, you didn't pay me all my labor hours, my vacation time and stuff. And then if you didn't manage that contract and secure those documents, you may not have a record of it. OK, so all the more reason to think the things that you do now, it pays off for you in the end. Is it extra work that you don't want to do? Probably. OK, but do you I'd rather take the time to do it right and know that I've done it right as opposed to waiting for a situation to happen to me. And now I'm going through the closet <laughs> or in the set, I'm digging through all of these records and stuff. The filing system is messed up. So this, you want to make sure, and the other, yeah. And the other thing is scan. Now you can scan documents, okay? And that's even better than having paper copies, okay? So any questions about, you know, the information that I cover with you? <laughs> Um, and a part of it, as you mature, as, as government contractors, probably some of the stuff here doesn't make a lot of sense because say, you know, I'm a subcontractor or I'm doing this and I'm just standing up my business. So some of this, the things that you, that you hear now, you know, you have used them as you mature in the space and as you continue to grow and expand your company and stuff. But I'd rather you have the information and the know-how. So when you get ready to do it, hopefully you'll do it right.